Welcome back to Introduction to Theater at Austin P. State University. I'm your instructor, Emily Seal. Today I'd like to start with a poem. We're talking about playwriting, and it seems very appropriate on many levels, which I'll get to later, but this is a play called, I mean a, a poem called Aristotle by Billy Collins. This is the beginning. Almost anything can happen. This is you where you find the creation of light, a wriggling fish onto land, the first word of paradox lost on an empty page. This is the very beginning. The first person narrator introduces himself, tells us about his lineage. The mezzo-soprano stands in the wings. Here the climbers are studying the map, or pulling on their long woolen socks. This is early on, years before the arc dawn. The profile of an animal is being smeared on the wall of a cave, and you have not yet learned to crawl. This is the opening, the gamut, a pawn moving forward an inch. This is her, your first night with her, your first night without her. This is the first part where the wheels begin to turn, where the elevator begins its ascent, before the doors lurch apart. This is the middle. Things have had time to get complicated, messy, really. Nothing is simple any more. Cities have sprouted up along the rivers, teeming with people at cross-purposes, a million schemes, a million wild looks. Disappointment unshoulders his knapsack here and pitches his ragged tent. This is the sticky part where the plot congeals, where the action suddenly reverses and swerves off in an outrageous direction. Here the narrator devotes a long paragraph to why Miriam does not want Edward's child. Someone hides a letter under a pillow. Here the aria rises to a pitch, a song of betrayal, salted with revenge, and the climbing party has stuck on the ledge, halfway up the mountain. This is the bridge, the painful modulation, this is the thick of things, so many, so much is crowded into the middle, the guitars of Spain, piles of ripe avocados, Russian uniforms, noisy parties, lakeside kisses, arguments heard through a wall, too much to name, too much to think about. This is the end the car running out of road, the l river losing its name to the ocean, the long nose of the photographed horse touching the white electronic line. This is the colophon, the last elephant in the parade, the empty wheelchair, the pigeons floating down in the evening. Here the stage is littered with bodies. The narrator leads the characters to their cells, and the climbers are in their graves. It is me here hitting the period, and you closing the book. It's Sylvia Plath in the kitchen, and St. Clement with the anchor around his neck. This is the final bit, thinning away to nothing. This is the end, according to Aristotle, what we have all been waiting for. What everything comes down to, the destination we cannot help imagining, the streak of light in the sky, a hat on a peg, and outside the cabin, falling leaves. Once again, that poem is called Aristotle by Billy Collins, and it points to something we're going to talk about today, which is plot, beginning, middle, and end, and the formulas that playwrights use in order to create a strong plot. William Shakespeare said, as the sun is daily new and old, so is my love of telling what is told, and uh, we'll look at some of those formula plots today as we explore what a playwright is. So let's start with the word playwright. It does have that funny spelling there. And it's just like in the Middle Ages, a wheelwright, someone who creates something. And you'll notice that, uh, you know, a novelist or a journalist, they don't have that right in their name there um, because a play is just a blueprint for something that is going to be created. A play is just the building blocks for an event and so they're really creating something. They're making something out of nothing but a white page. So that's why they get that right, W-R-I-G-H-T, in their name as the root of their name. So there's many processes. Um, most playwrights work alone and they create their beautiful baby and it takes them years and they do it all by themselves. But sometimes, and increasingly more often in television today, there's a sense of workshopping or improvisation. You may be familiar with the TV show Whose Line Is It Anyway? That's improv, where people just kind of come up with things off the top of their head. Um, this has become fashionable for a lot of fresh comedy, uh, for example, Curb Your Enthusiasm. They just come up with the plot of the story and uh, then they improvise the lines within. Um, some other 
popular uh, people who do a lot of improvising. Vince Vaughn, almost all of his movies, like Anger Man and um, his comedies, he does a lot of improvisation on the set. Uh, it's Always Sunny in Philadelphia has a lot of improvisation in the set. They have some scripted lines, but other things are workshopped or improv This is also a trend in the theater especially in the 70s and then it's kind of being rebirthed today uh, they talk about carol churchill the famous british uh, or english feminist writer in cloud nine how she sort of workshopped with the actors to make the language more um, suitable but then also there's a trend towards using journalistic events monologuers are becoming very popular off broadway with off broadway they take an event or a um, current issue, a newspaper um, article, and then turn it into a monologue or a play. Most famous example of that is Laramie Project, which is about Matthew Shepard, who was a homosexual who uh, was a victim of a hate crime. And so they took real interviews and then transposed those to be part of a story. Um, also, we talk about Mike Daisy and uh, he did a uh, Apple expose against um, against the Apple Corporation. He claimed to have gone to China and seen uh, horrible working conditions for the people at the uh, Steve Jobs plant there. Uh, but then his translator came forward and said that all of those allegations were untrue. So um, Mike Daisy was sort of disgraced and. Uh, that was that. He said he was taking some creative license, but most uh, serious playwrights or journalists would dismiss that as uh, just lying, <laughs> right? Just lying. Um, I'm going to kind of skip this stuff about the unions. I think it uh, doesn't really seem like vital information for an introduction level class. So, But I did want to mention that a lot of playwrights don't make much money. <laughs> And some of them have cr crossed over into writing screen uh, plays because that does make more money. Um, Susan Laurie Parks, who is on your page um, 123 uh, and 121, she uh, has we talked about her a little bit when we talked about diversity, but she has done some pl screenwriting. You can see their eyes were watching God. She did the um, some writing on that, and then also Tony Kushner uh, has been doing more and more screenwriting, including Lincoln, which was a very successful play this year. So playwrights uh, can do quite a bit of television work or uh, movie work and make quite a bit more money than they can on the theater. So uh, a lot of theater people joke about the movie paying for their the movie kind of being their day job and supporting their theater habit um, and we definitely see that with playwrights they can scoot over into theater or film make a name for themselves make more money and then come back to playwriting so why would playwrights want to move into theater uh, tom stoppard says it best all playwrights rich or poor want to nudge the world a little right and if you're writing for television remember you're for hire or if you're writing for a film, you're often for hire, and they can edit your script and change your script, and, and it's not really yours to the same extent that it is if it's a theater. In theater, remember, you are licensed out, your words are protected, uh, you can be sued if you do not stick to the script as it is, so um, playwrights really get to hear their authentic voice heard. So. And uh, Tom Stoppard is a fantastic playwright. Uh, his most famous work is Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Dead, which is kind of a um, Hamlet absurd version. You may remember in Hamlet, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are very small characters. So there are scenes from Hamlet that actually have Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, but then there are other scenes uh, when they're just waiting uh waiting for Hamlet to come around again and there's a lot of absurd elements half the time they can't remember who is Rosencrantz and who is Guildenstern and um, you know it's it's very um, well just absurd it's just as absurd as his hairdo is in that picture <laughs> um, 
So what's playwright process? Um, there are lots of playwrights have different processes, um, but I think it's interesting on page 27, the interview with Sarah Rule, she talks about things she just overheard. So she was at a dinner party and someone said, my cleaning lady is depressed and she won't clean our house. And that resulted in the play Clean House. Um, Neil Simon very famously said when he was walking down the streets in New York in the 70s, he would just listen. And uh, that would always inspire him to do his plays. Uh, I listened on NPR recently to a uh, young Latino playwright, and she volunteers in the inner city where she grew up. But she volunteers with these young Latino girls to just be hip. Or not, that's not the only reason she volunteers, assumingly. But she volunteers primarily to kind of get a feel of their language and stay uh, current on the kind of dialogue that she's writing. So. To many playwrights, it's interesting how um, mundane some of their inspiration can be. But you remember August Wilson, his inspiration came from uh, Romero Bearden's paintings and blues music. So inspiration can come from everywhere. But uh, don't say anything around a playwright you don't want to end up in a play, because they will snatch it. They will steal your ideas. Um, so dialogue dialogue. We're getting into sort of the nuts and bolts of playwriting. Dialogue is a spoken text between two or more characters, right? So the words that the characters are saying. Um, obviously that's a scene from Romeo and Juliet. Uh, Wherefore art thou Romeo? And um, that dialogue between the two characters, the, the give and take, uh, is how they express themselves, the words they say out loud, as opposed to a monologue, which is just one person speaking on stage alone. So dialogue is the language spoken aloud. So um, he makes reference to the parentheticals and also to stage directions. And those two things can sometimes be the same. Um, so obviously Timon there says, gentlemen, excuse me one moment. And up above it, it says disappointed, that emotional response. That is a parenthetical. That's a hint to the actor of how the playwright intends for the line to be delivered. Um, in most plays, it's not going to be more than one or two words. Uh, but then the stage directions are going to be a little bit longer. Throws hands up in the air, bounds towards the entrance. That's an example of stage directions. Now sometimes those are what the original playwright wrote, and then other times the stage directions in the book are merely what the stage manager uh, wrote down as the initial blocking. And they put that in there for the amateur productions, for um, directors who are new at this. It kind of gives a hint at what the original staging production was and um, kind of the physical movements. So once again, parentheticals are usually emotions and stage directions are usually physical blocking action throughout the script. So um, I'm not going to belabor theme on page 128. You guys have heard about that already. It's uh, open to interpretation. Most playwrights don't state their theme directly or focus on it too heavily. So moving on, playwriting as action, characters as action. I really like the way that he says this. It's very poetic in saying that the characters in plays have to be brave. You know, we make decisions every day not to act. You know, someone says something rude to us and, and we just sort of, you know, well, they're my boss, so I shouldn't say anything. Or, oh, that's a really cute guy, but I probably shouldn't go kiss him uh, because I'm married. Right? So we have these thoughts, but uh, characters and plays have to be much bolder. They have to be people who get the action going. Um, remember, the original word for drama uh, was to do. Right? These have got to be things of action. That poem that I just read you by Billy Collins, it's words, it's emotions, it's descriptors, but it's not necessarily action. Plays have to be action oriented, right? Romeo must be willing to endanger his life to protect his love, right? They have to be fighters. So in order for it to stay interesting, they always have to have conflict, right? If a hundred theater people are in a room, they're going to disagree about everything else except the fact that a play has to have conflict. 
we have to have desires we have to have obstacles to those desires and if not people are going to leave before intermission right and so even though conflict is something that we think of as a bad thing in our own lives some of us anyway hide from conflict in plays it's really essential conflict within the family conflict within society these are what keep the story going so he gives sort of a formula on page 129 starting on page 129 and uh, this formula is kind of one way to analyze script. There are many, many ways to analyze a script. But this is one interesting way. So we start with desire. The character has to have an, a feeling or a need, right? An obstacle, a clear uh, barrier to what that person wants. So. Um, desire an actor question would be what's my motivation right the obstacle would be the thing standing between you and what you want and the reason compromise is not an option is the fuel that keeps that going right so for example our Alice in Wonderland that we watched uh, Alice wants social importance right she crawls down the rabbit hole she chases uh, that white bunny around because she wants to be his friend or she wants to know him and then when the opportunity of being a queen happens uh, you know she starts chasing that goal that crown she meets these different characters and she's always trying to relate to them in a way that makes her socially important she wants status and uh, she wants friendship she wants not to be alone um, her biggest obstacle is that she doesn't know the social landscape she doesn't know the rules of the game she doesn't know to bring a flamingo to the croquet game if she wants to play chess with the queen right um, she doesn't know all of these rules that in Wonderland down is up and up is down uh, and she must curtsy while she's saying your majesty um, she's not familiar with the social landscape and then she's also not a aware of the physical landscape she keeps getting lost everywhere she turns she's asking people where am I going where, where is the eight square I don't know how to get there I don't know how to get out of this right so two reasons she keeps going and can't give up is because she is lost she doesn't know she can't do it by herself so she needs other people to help her get to where she needs to be the other reason is that Alice is proud <laughs> right Alice wants to appear important she wants all of the uh, she wants the popularity as it were and she wants to be seen as civil and dignified right she doesn't want to be seen as just a kid so <laughs> so that's one way to analyze uh, a play and we'll get into some longer ones but just a minute let's veer off into language this is my niece my sister's younger one I showed you a picture of Samson in the first uh, sort of video but this is Vera and uh, as I'm recording this she is nine months old and she cries a lot right and we always have to try to figure out why is Vera crying it's not her fault she doesn't cry um, any more than the average infant but infants cry quite a bit if you haven't gotten that memo already um, so we talk when we want something Vera doesn't just cry to annoy her mother she cries because she's hungry she cries because her teeth hurt she cries because you take away the knife that she wanted to play with right she cries because she wants something and the same is true of most actors and characters on stage uh, the character wants something and most of the words that are in a play are action oriented so just remember that every kind of thing they say goes back to their unfulfilled desires in many traditional plays so um, one thing that kind of happens in human interaction is subtext so this is three sisters a play uh, that was produced in New York City recently you can see Peter Sarsgaard and Maggie uh, Gyllenhaal there um, this is a famous scene with Masha and the soldier. Now Masha is getting away, ready to run away with a soldier. And I used to require my introduction to acting students to uh, perform this scene. And I wouldn't go over the plot before, but it was quickly uh, clear to me who had read the entire play because this entire scene just reads like small talk. Oh, isn't it cold? Oh, look at the weather. Um, 
but if you know the story you know that they're about to run away together so even though they're saying oh isn't it cold the subtext is flirtation the subtext is we can't talk about this here but I want to spend quality time with you uh, the con the subtext is oh I'm cold let me snuggle up to closer to you even though this is forbidden love so subtext is not necessarily what's in the line but what's underneath the line if I walk down the halls of my college institution and I see two people flirting they once again could be talking about the weather but that's not really what they mean it's not really what they're talking about we tend to especially do this with people that we're super close to that we kind of know the um, unwritten rules about what we're not supposed to talk about so you sort of hint around and dance around and say things in a uh, less an obvious way you know if my grandmother said oh you're big boned right she really means you've gained weight uh, if they say oh she's passed on they really mean she's dead but uh, we sort of hint at those things and gloss them over and find happy words for them and in some cases we're not even the words don't even have anything to do with the meaning the subtext is something completely um, different but it comes through with our tones and with our body language so way is characters listen uh, this is a scene from the piano lesson you may remember from the August Wilson video he talks about um, a scene in piano lesson when he says what time Bernice get home and then um, Lionel says back to him uh, why are you worried about when Bernice get home you know she makes her own money and it's n never given the direct answer to the question and it's not as straightforward so what are the characters listening to the other people in what way what are they what information do they want to glean from that um, you know if my husband says what time do you get home and I say I still need you to do the dishes right um, I may be cutting him off at the pass I think he's going to get to you have more time than I do and so I jump to a conclusion and answer the question for him it also kind of hints at what our priorities are right Lionel is protecting Bernice in that situation when he says why are you worried what time she get home uh, you don't need to be worrying about her he's kind of protecting Bernice so what the character gives is a response to a question how the character cuts the other one off of the past what they hear is sometimes different from what is said right um, some of you are what are called expansive listeners so if you're talking to your boyfriend and he says oh I'm not really in the mood for Mexican food tonight you may hear oh my goodness he doesn't want to have dinner oh he doesn't want to spend time with me I bet he wants to break up right and you have taken one line that is very direct and simple and you've expanded on it you created an expansive vast information that's not necessarily what they meant so that's sort of an interesting way to look at dialogue sometimes people are ignored sometimes they're misinterpreted sometimes there's a special hint word in there uh, a forbidden topic that they're encroaching on um, but it has to do reveals a lot about what the person is thinking how they respond to other characters on stage how they listen so uh, we're moving down into imagery imagery is particularly important in the poetic realism in the 1930s and 1940s 1950s American plays uh, relied very very heavily on imagery and the imagery is very important to the themes of the plays um, now they're still important today but even more so in this time so raisin in the sun talks about it later in the chapter you may remember but Walter Lee uh, played by Sean P Diddy Combs in the bottom there um, is an entrepreneur he wants to open a liquor store whereas uh, the mother uh, mama at the top there um, she decides to take the inheritance money and go buy a house instead of investing in this liquor store so the question that is open by Lorraine Hansberry at the opening of the show is what happens to a raisin in the Sun does it dry up like a sore and run right so the question is a dream deferred what happens when these african-american people can't get what they want right Walter Lee wants a job mama wants a house uh, 
Bertha wants to be a doctor and um, Walter Lee's wife wants a family so they've all got these aspirations but you have to remember when you're living in the slums in Southside Chicago you don't have the opportunities so what happens is that it dries up your hope sags like a heavy load right and one of the examples there is uh, rotting meat right what happens to a raisin it gets sugary sweet what happens to a dream deferred it spoils and it deflates and it sags and uh, it's an important symbol for every character in the in the play so Glass Menagerie is played by Tennessee Williams it's one of the great American plays uh, Tom down here in the left hand side he is trying his best to take care of Amanda his mother and his sister there. Um, his sister you can see is disabled and she's very afraid all the time. She's supposed to be in typing school but she doesn't like the noise that her braces make when she walks through the hall so she has quit typing school and she just kind of walks around uh, in the park to make her mother think that she's still in school. Um, Tom is working long hours trying to support his family and Amanda is still in this dream world she's still obsessed with southern charm and southern culture and the idea that her daughter can find a suitor or a husband um, and the title glass menagerie has to do with Laura the disabled daughter's obsession with these little glass frail objects and they're very breakable and they're very fragile just like Laura is so it's a big symbol for beauty but also frailty and uh, a symbol for what Laura is. Another uh, great uh, play of the poetic realism movement is by Arthur Miller. Some of you may have had to read this play in high school. Uh, it's a popular required reading because it's a very important play. Um, so these girls uh, create a witch hunt and they have this mass hysteria and they start pointing fingers trying to find uh, who the witches are, who the evildoers are. They're going to seek them out and destroy them. Uh, and this title, The Crucible, is a type of metal device that you heat up but doesn't break. So it's sort of a symbol for the American people. Um, we are hard pressed but even under pressure, even when people accuse us of being evil, there are repeated characters, Elizabeth Proctor for one, who's willing to die for what she believes. Um, she will not be moved by some mass hysterical people. Um, and so Arthur Miller is pointing to the crucible as a symbol of what American people, good American people, are like. So those are just some images to think about, some famous images in um, American theater. So now for something completely different. <laughs> shake, shake, shake your money maker like you were shaking it for some paper. Took your mama nine months to make you. Might as well shake what your mama gave you. You, you looking good in them jeans. I bet you look even better with me in between. I keep my mind on my money, money on my mind. But you's a hell of a distraction when you shake your behind. Courtesy of Ludicrous title money maker so I wanted to point to some um, relatively hip uh, song to kind of explain how language isn't necessarily something that people sit down and uh, craft carefully in all situations. I seriously doubt that Ludacris was thinking about the poetics of this when he wrote it. He just had fun with his words and this is what came out. So as we analyze poetry, sometimes it can feel like we're killing it, killing the joy of it uh, by over dissecting it. But I just want to point out that um, this is poetry just like the plays, just like Shakespeare, this is poetry. So to the left there, I've put an A1, A2. That's the rhyme scheme. You can see that maker, paper, mind behind, these things rhyme. So um, I just want to talk about some important poetic terms that you've probably heard before. So this is a particularly important one in theater, which is onomatopoeia, right? Shake, 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 
It sounds like someone shaking something. And uh, this is really important for actors. Uh, you know, words like revenge, right? It has a quality similar to what the word means. So when you say it like that, revenge, right? It's a fun word to kind of create an onomatopoeic quality for. So when something sounds like zip, zap, zoom, those are onomatopoeia words. So metaphor comparison using like or as, right? Shake it like you were shaking it for paper. Paper is an allusion to money. So shake it as if you were a stripper is the insinuation there. Now, an alliteration is a repeated consonant sound. So when you're reading these plays, listen for the word play that has to do with repeated consonant sounds. And it's a way for playwrights to draw your attention to important words. So M is the most important uh, word in this poem, right? Mama, moneymaker, right? Moneymaker is the key. So there, look at how many M's are just in that one line. Might as well shake what your mama gave you, right? Um, they use that M a lot, and it's a creation of alliteration. Now, by the way, two cents. Assonance is the repeated vowel sound. So when we have a repeated vowel sound, that's called assonance. Repetition, right? It's not just that you look good in them jeans. You, you look good in them jeans, right? So that repeated word adds an emphasis, right? If you see a word repeated over and over again in dialogue, there's a good chance that that's important to either the theme or the character insinuation. This is why we can still teach Shakespeare to high schoolers <laughs> because some scenes are so incredibly crass and lewd. Uh, Macbeth, the porter scene, Romeo and Juliet, he talks about Rosalind. Uh, so when Romeo first comes into the scene, he is infatuated with a woman named Rosalind and uh, he talks about her quivering thigh and all that adjacent lies there. So if the, the high schoolers were smart enough to know that they were talking about Rosalind's uh, private parts, we probably wouldn't be able to teach it in schools. But uh, as it is, uh, Shakespeare uses a lot of insinuations and a lot of um, references to things that that modern audiences might not get. Usually a lot of penis jokes, I'll just be honest with you. Um, but because our modern audiences don't catch all the insinuations, we get away with still teaching it in school systems and kind of glazing over that. So there's something to write home to your English teacher about. Um, Another thing that we see lots and lots in plays is references to outside authors, right? I keep my mind on my money, money on my mind. Those of you who are fans of hip hop know that Ludacris did not write that. It was around long before. Um, Shakespeare quotes the Bible more than any other source by far, right? And a lot of the uh, modern playwrights are going to have references to outside events. Like I said, some of these modern monologuers are just quoting the newspapers. So if you're an educated audience, you're more likely to get a lot out of certain authors. Now, not every author. Some people like Neil Simon, they're just there for the jokes. But other playwrights like Tony Kushner that are more intellectual, um, even Mel Brooks, even people who are sort of jokingly intellectual, they're going to have a lot of references to outside authors. And if you know the historical context, you're going to get a laugh quicker than other people. You're going to get the jokes. An elision. People freak out in, in old classic plays when they see elisions. Uh, Duff, you know. Um, and elisions are purely there to create uh, beats, right? But use a hell of a distraction, right? Instead of saying you is a hell of a distraction, he says use, and it creates an elision two or more sil uh, a syllable is taken out and we kind of create that ain't right is also an elision so um, when you see those in plays don't be afraid of them they're there to create a sense of beat or poetry right and poetry beats are very very important so every character has their own rhythm they have their own diction they have the words they say depending on their age depending on their education level depending on their socio and economic status um, so a good example of this is Frasier 
Um, you may have seen this show before. He is wealthy. He listens to the opera. He talks about all this stuff. And his father and his um, physical therapist there, Daphne, she is very down to earth right and she speaks with a British accent Cockney accent and she's more likely to reference um, sporting events or down-to-earth things whereas he's more likely to talk about opera and use grandiose words and sort of colorful diction that's over dramatic whereas Daphne is more realistic and shortened to the point so um, as you write characters if you ever decide to write a play just know that each voice needs to be distinct. We need to be able to tell the difference between multiple characters based on their rhythm and the word choice that they have. They need to have a distinct voice because all of us have a different voice. Um, Some of us use the jargon that we hear on TV if we watch MTV or something like that um, or watch YouTube videos then we pick up words or slang or modern diction. It also has to do with our culture right? Um, August Wilson uses turns of phrase that I don't, right? Because I'm not African American. So, Um, all right, so now we're going to kind of get into a pretty complex scheme, which is formula plots. Um, So plots have a structure or a logical sequence, and um, many different formulas exist and this is just one way of sort of dissecting it you may have heard a different one when you had high school English Um, but this is one way of sort of looking at that traditional triangle sort of model upside down triangle so the formula plot always begins with backstory or exposition so when um, Shakespeare begins Romeo and Juliet. He says, Two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona, where we lay our scene, from ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lover take their life, whose misadventure piteous overthrows, do with their death bury their parents' strife. So not only does he give us the backstory, but he gives us the ending of the whole thing as well in that first half of the prologue. But the prologue is a device to just get the exposition out of the way up front. Um, They're not modern anymore. People don't usually do prologues. But in this one, he tells us where we are, Fair Verona. He tells us who is going, who's fighting, which is the two households, the Capulets and the Montagues. He tells us that they're enemies, and he tells us that there's already been deaths. There's already been civil blood and civil hands unclean. So not only were they deaths, but they were wrongful deaths, right? And so he kind of sets the entire scene by just saying where they are, right? A lot of the modern tricks we have with costume and uh, and sound effects that Shakespeare didn't have, we can create exposition just through the technical elements. So... One of my favorites is the jackhammer. Why do we always know in a movie when we hear a jackhammer that we're in New York City? Is there really that much construction in New York City? I don't know. But anytime we hear it in a movie, we know, okay, we're in the big city, probably New York. So sometimes they do it that way, right? They don't have to say um, this is a a like in dignity, right? Shakespeare would have to say that because they didn't really rely on costumes that much. But when... Um, Boz Lerman opens this Romeo and Juliet we see how well dressed the characters are so we both know that they're dignified because they're so well dressed and so exposition happens less in a modern audience because we have technical effects but we still need some of the exposition unfolding and for bad playwrights this is the hardest right they make it so obvious Um, hi friend I'm so glad we're headed to the store right it can feel very contrived and uh, so different playwrights have different ways of sort of giving exposition Uh, a ghost showing up and them talking to a ghost uh, that's a common sort of I guess uh, pretty common way of getting exposition out of people Um, but exposition is kind of a hard thing to write a backstory the what happened before the story starts 
protagonist. There we have Romeo, oh Romeo. I would argue that Romeo is our protagonist in Romeo and Juliet. I think there's a really interesting trend right now in television in having an anti-hero. Um, we had one in the 70s with um, uh, Woody Allen and some of those uh, but more and more on television we're having unlikable characters kind of being our protagonists uh, as I'm recording this Breaking Bad is having a marked success it's about to end uh, but he's you know a guy who cooks meth and he's our protagonist uh, Dexter is a show that I really enjoy you know he kills people um, but he is our protagonist. So just because they're the person who carries the action, they are the protagonist, doesn't necessarily mean that our, they're our hero or our good guy. Obviously, Hamlet and Hamlet is the protagonist. Macbeth and Macbeth is the protagonist, even though he kills people, right? Romeo, I would argue, is our protagonist here. And Romeo is from the house of Montague, which means his father's name is Montague. Not necessarily that that's his last name. So the antagonists are the Capulets, right? The whole family. Juliet's dad is Capulet, and everyone who follows Capulet is considered the enemy of Romeo. They're out to stifle his plans, right? Particularly, I would say, Capulet, the man, Juliet's father, who would definitely not approve. So moving on to page 138, we look at the event right? The unusual incident, the special occasion, the crisis that they come to. And in Romeo and Juliet, uh, I do bite my thumb at you would be our first sort of event to start the action out. And it, you notice it happens as soon as the curtain comes up. Do you bite my thumb at I do bite my thumb, right? It happens right there at the beginning that we have some conflict. Um, so the event is the special crisis that happens right at the beginning. So the disturbance then is the inciting incident, right? The thing that throws th things out of balance. So we begin with some sense of normalcy, and we talked about this a little bit in the first lecture, what is normal, and then we kind of get that push into the swimming pool. We sort of get that uh, beginning of the action, your first night with her, your first night without her, uh, as we said in the poem, the event that gets things started. And here in your book, they argue that that event is the party where Romeo and Juliet fall in love, right, despite their family's feud. So the disturbance is um, the fact that Romeo and Juliet decide that um, they're going to fall in love despite what their family thinks, right? She has a moment of realization, oh, uh, would a rose by any other name would sell, smell as sweet. You know, she's thinking, okay, his name is Montague, but I still love him. So that is kind of the moment of disturbance where they decide to plow forward it gets the action rolling and the conflict between the protagonist and the antagonist sort of heatens up, heatens up. So the point of attack would arguably be when Romeo and jo Juliet decide to get married anyway. It's a major decision that will result in conflict. We know that as, because this happens, oh no, we see it coming down the pike. Something even worse is about to happen. So we move on to the complication right so the complication is um, a roadblock something directly standing in the way of their success so Tybalt uh, comes after uh, Romeo and um, even though he's Juliet's cousin uh, Romeo and he are fighting and so he is a direct in-line opponent against um, Romeo and then we have that horrible dark moment when Romeo is exiled from the city for fighting with Tybalt. So the dark moment as I said is just uh, when everything falls apart it seems like everything is completely lost right we saw the desperation on Romeo's face I couldn't keep it there too long because I didn't realize that action graphic moved it's too distracting <laughs> so the enlightenment is when we start to see a path out this kind of you can think of it as a little bone the playwright throws us to think oh there is hope after the darkness comes the silver lining uh, you know it's the sunshine after the rain so 
uh, in our case it would be uh, this priest who says I can give you this medicine you can fall asleep everybody will think you're dead genius option path out but then of course we have to come to the climax so the climax is always going to be in the last few moments of the play um, in a theater event it's always going to be especially in modern plays the last moments because after you climax there's nothing to stick around for we've gotten the answer to the question uh, somebody's been killed somebody's been kissed uh, you know the story is over so um, it's the greatest dramatic tension throughout the entire play if it's staged well this will be the moment that feels like the most exciting in the play and according to our book, the climax is when Romeo commits suicide and then Julia awakens. What? Not dead. That scene, not quite dead. Uh, that would be the climax of the play. Uh, and then we watch her decide what she's going to do, which is to take her own life. So the denouement is kind of the last little bit that rolls it back together uh, in Romeo and Juliet it would be that last scene when the prince kind of gives this never was there such a tale of woe then Juliet and her Romeo right we have this nice little neat putting it back into the box the denouement is that the Capulet and the Montague let go of their feud and decide to all get along so hopefully that's given you one way to analyze a play um, can kind of watch for that and different stories that go by very formulaic plots. It's a very traditional way of approaching a story. and um, But there are different than that now. There's plays that don't necessarily have a set plot the way that the traditional formula does. One of the best examples of this is one act plays, short plays. Um, the Humana Festival goes on in Louisville, Kentucky and it is a short play festival most of the plays presented there are 10 minutes long. So um, obviously those things don't have a clear denouement. They don't have all of this inciting incident and all of that. Um, if you're looking on page 142, they talked about some other, you know, 10 minute plays, uh, full length one act plays, when to have intermission. Traditionally a play is about two and a half hours. And that was the time between meals, the time between either lunch and dinner, breakfast and lunch, or after dinner was over and time to go to sleep. So about two and a half hours was a good in-between time. The play that you're going to see for this class, I'd like it to be about two and a half hours. Please don't go see a 10 minute play and then uh, try to write a critique about it. There's just not going to be enough there. But, you know, Chekhov, some of these realistic writers tried to be unpredictable. They didn't want to follow the old fashioned formulas. They wanted to catch people off guard. So that was sort of how they did it is by going by a non-traditional structure. So hopefully this wasn't all review. Hopefully some of this um, you have learned outside of English class today. I know it feels a lot like English class today. Um, thank you so much for listening.